doing this morning? Man, everybody came to church today. This is good. Man. <laughs> Didn't even know where to put all y'all. <laughs> but that's a good thing, you know, man. Who is glad to be in the house of God this morning? That's right. That is right. Man, there's nowhere else I'd rather be on Sunday morning just, just worshiping the name of the Lord with you all. Thank you all for being here. My name is Scott Matthews. I'm your campus pastor. And if this is your first time here, we hope you feel at home here at River Oaks and Elkhart. Now, I'll tell you, one thing I love about our vision and what we're trying to do is that we want this church to look like Elkhart County. We want it to look like our city. Man, I'm seeing that. I love it. I'm just seeing all the different people from here, from there, from this background, from that background. I, I love it because at the end of the day, we are children of God. Amen. amen. That's what's so important. That gets me excited. I love seeing that. And if, if the, yeah, that gets you excited too, then I'm, I'm glad you're here. So, that's right, that's right. If you haven't noticed, we are starting a brand new series this morning. We're going to take it back to the beginning. And I hope you brought your Bible with you because we're going to get your Bible working today. Okay? We're starting a brand new series. A couple weeks ago, we were actually in Revelation. Now we're going to take it back to the beginning. And we're going to dive into the book of Genesis. We're going to look at kind of where things began, kind of how it all happened, and we're just going to see how the Word of God back in Genesis still applies for us today. What God said thousands of years ago is still applied for us today. Guys, one thing you got to understand is that God never changes. God has never changed. Things progress the way we do church, the way we do things. That should always progress and get better. But, but regardless of what it is, it doesn't matter until when, when the dawn of time all the way until Jesus returns. God's principles, his morals, his standard has never changed. And thank God it hasn't. We, we, we need something to stand on. It's so important that we see that. In the book of Genesis, we can see some of God's amazing principles that he has for us. What's, what's probably one of the most fascinating questions that, that you see is how did we get here? It's one of the most fascinating questions you think about. How, how did we get here? How did all this start, right? How did everything begin? Right, we're still, people are still trying to figure out how do we get here, how did everything begin? And since I've been given this life, what should I be doing, right? Why are we here? Some of those fascinating questions that scientists and philosophers still grapple with. People are still trying to answer these questions. Now, maybe if you are, maybe obviously you've been through school and you went through science class and everything, you guys know this already, that, that the, the, the prevailing view is that 13.7 billion years ago, there was a massive explosion that was caused by nothing, and uh, nothing was there. And uh, these gases and these other things, these molecules were condensed, and everything blew up. And it's been evolving into the universe we know today all on its own. If you don't know, that's called the Big Bang Theory. And notice I said theory. Right? There are a lot of people who believe different variations of that and different things about how we got here. But I, and I'll tell you, some scientists believe that. But I think it's also important that you know that not all scientists believe that. But I will tell you guys this, the Bible also tells us why we're here. Scripture also tells us the beginning and how things began and, and, and how things happened. Now it's, it's amazing to see how that is. Scripture tells us how, but Scripture doesn't go into amazing detail, right? Scripture doesn't go down into the molecules and the atoms and how all these bonds are connected. Scripture doesn't do that. The Word of God is not necessarily worried so much about those simple details, God, the Bible tells us who and why. Scripture is more concerned about telling you who brought you here, who put you here, and why you're here. That is the narrative of, of so much of what we see at the beginning of Scripture. We, we got to understand that. We, we got to see that. that. That's why. Because if I can understand who and I can understand why, the details will start to make sense. If I can understand who and why, even the details I, are, that are unknown to me can start to make sense. How many of you guys are brand snobs? I mean, you have a brand of things you like, right? If it's an iPhone, you like an iPhone. If it's a Samsung, you like your Samsung. If it's an Apple, I'd rather prefer Dell computer, that computer. You, you probably don't even know how all those intricate details of your iPhone works. If you opened up that, that Apple tablet, you would have no idea the intricate details of the motherboard, but you trust it, right? You trust, if you turned on your Ford truck, because you love Ford, right? I love my Ford, right? If you looked at your Ford truck, you probably wouldn't know all the simple, intricate details. Some of us don't even know all those things, but yet you trust it. Same thing goes all the time. We, we do these all throughout our life. We do this all throughout, throughout the case. If I know who 
And if I know why, I put my trust in it. Scientists continue to uncover the beauty of our world. It's amazing. I love science. I love being in it, right? I, I love it. But we'll never know all the exact details of how life began. I don't care how many lab tests and things we do, we'll never understand all the mysteries of life. None of us will. But when we know the why and we know the who, right, we, and we even grapple with why am I here and what should I be doing, but when we put our trust in the manufacturer in heaven, when we put our trust in the creator, he can help us understand the details that are still so unknown. And as we read through the book of Genesis, it uncovers God's original plan for mankind, but also how mankind broke his relationship from his creator. And one of the amazing things that God has never left his people. He's never left us and he'll never forsake us. And we're going to see this played out in the book of Genesis. Now, there are some very basic things you need to know about this book before we dive into it. Number one, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. <laughs> if you didn't know that, now you know. Okay. It's right there in the front. It's the very first book of the Bible. As a matter of fact, the word Genesis, the Hebrew word is reshif. It means origin or it means beginnings. That's literally what that word means, origins or beginnings. And, and the Bible is, isn't just, uh, you know, it's, it's not just uh, one book. It's one idea, but it's actually 66 letters written over 1,600 years by 40 different authors. It's amazing. But yet all these authors and all these different books have one story. And Moses was the writer of Genesis. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's what we call the Torah. The Jewish people call this their law. They lived by this law. This is what they did. This was their constitution, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. This is what they lived by. It's also called the, the, the Pentateuch because that's five, right? Penta means five. So Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, and this is called his, the law. And this is what the people live by. But specifically in Genesis, we're given the history of mankind and how things began and why things are the way they are. Now, when you read the Bible, one of the things you have to approach is this. You have to know who is the writer writing to. Now, we know he's writing to us, right? The, the scripture is for us. But there was an original audience that, that the writer was writing to. Who was the original audience? Who was Moses writing to? I'll tell you. Moses was writing to the people of Israel who had freshly come out of slavery. The people of Israel had spent 400 years in bondage and in slavery, and they needed to know who they were. They needed to know where they came from. They needed a structure around their life. Because for four centuries, they spent so much time of their life not knowing who they were. They went in there as a family. But they came out as a nation, and they needed structure, they needed order, and, and they needed guidance. And that is exactly what, what, what we see here. For 400 years, these people, all they knew was Egyptian culture. They knew Egyptian society. They didn't know what it meant to worship the one true God of heaven like their ancestors did. They needed a genesis. They needed a beginning. And as we go through this, you'll see kind of how it started. If, if you don't know how they ended up in, in Egypt, it was all started with a man named Joseph. Joseph was an Israelite who rose to power in Egypt. And as he rose to power in Egypt, he brought his 12 brothers and his father with him to live in Egypt. And they all settled there, 12 guys, 12 guys with their families and their dad. And their family grew and it grew and it grew until one day Joseph died. And when Joseph died, there was a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And they got scared of the people of Israel. They got scared of them, so they, so they enslaved them. And for 400 years, these people were enslaved with no structure, no system, and, and none of that stuff. So what we find is that God raised up a man named Moses to bring them out of this slavery with amazing miracles. We, we hear about how God split the Red Sea and all these things that he did to bring these people out of slavery. But 2 million people, what do you do with 2 million people? Right? The, the, the Red Sea was split. They, got, they came up out of, out of Egypt amazingly, and all of a sudden, everybody twiddling their thumbs like, okay, now what? They went in as a family, but they came out as a nation, and they needed, they needed structure and order. And it's amazing how 2,000-some years later, we still need structure and order, don't we? Our world still needs God's structure, his order, and his commands. So Moses was given the law. He was given the customs. He was given the, the Ten Commandments, all these things, because these people needed identity. They needed to know who they were, and we still need that today. 
So when you read through the book of Genesis, remember, Moses is writing to people who needed structure. He's writing to people who are freshly coming out of slavery, who needed structure and order in their life. And they needed purpose in who, in, into who they were. They were having a, a Genesis moment. This was a new beginning for them right at square one. I remember watching a, a documentary. I like do- watching documentaries, man. I'm weird. So I remember watching a documentary about a man who had been in prison for 40 years. He was locked up in prison for most of his life. And when he finally got out of prison, he needed a Genesis. He had no idea how to even buckle a, a seatbelt buckle because when he went into prison, seatbelts weren't even invented. He didn't even know how to use a cell phone. The man didn't even know how to use a remote. He, he needed structure. He needed, he needed a new order. He needed a genesis. The same thing was true with the people of Israel. They came out of slavery, and they needed order. And that is what God is giving them. He's showing them what it meant to live for him and who they were. They might have heard some of the stories of Adam. They probably still heard the stories of Abraham and Isaac and who their God was, but they needed a fresh teaching, a fresh understanding, and that is what these first five books of the Bible gave them, order and structure. So imagine, as you read Genesis, that you're someone freshly learning who Jehovah God is, freshly learning who who he is, but in 2023, we know that Genesis actually points to Jesus. It points all the way to Jesus. As a matter of fact, when the people of, of Israel finally got established and, and they read their Torah, and the people who were the Pharisees who would read it all the time to the people, Jesus said, I know you guys like reading that Torah, but remember that Genesis story, it actually points to me. It all points to me and what I'm going to do for you. So let's open this up. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Hope you brought your Bible with you. Right there in the front. <laughs> Genesis 1, verse 1. And we're going to read this and see what this big idea is. Genesis 1, verse 1 says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me stop right there. That right there is a whole sermon by itself. God created. In the beginning, God. That means before there were molecules, before there were atoms, before there were gases, before there, were, there, were, there was even the laws of physics, there was God. There was God. Before the beginning of time, there was God. This speaks to the eternal nature of who God is. He's always He's always been there. Guys, let me, let me tell you something. I, I, know, I know we love seeing our, our books and whatever it tells us, but things just don't appear by themselves, okay? There had to be something outside of the system to give a beginning to the system. There had to be something outside of it to, to, to give a, a beginning to everything else. Scripture tells us who it was. It was God. In the beginning, it was God. And that word God that Moses uses is an amazing word. In the original Hebrew, that word God he used is Elohim. It, it, means, it means one who is many within the one. One God who is many within himself. The triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, created everything with all power in his hands. That Elohim literally is a singular plural. It means the one God who has many within inside of himself put everything into motion. Who? It was God. And that's the word he uses. It wasn't some random impersonal force. It wasn't the universe. And guys, let me please tell you this. Please stop praying to the universe. If people say, man, I hope the universe, don't, no, no, we don't pray to God's creation. We pray to God, the the one who put the universe in its axis and put everything where it's supposed to be. We don't pray to the universe, okay? The God of heaven orchestrated, guided, and gave structure to the whole of creation. And what's more, he did it through his son, Jesus. The Bible says Jesus is the word of God. He created and put everything on his axis through his son, Jesus. And 1,600 years later, the writer of of the book of John says the same thing. The last writer says the same thing the first writer says. Look, Look, check this out. Go to John chapter 1. This is important. I think it's important you see this. John 1. Keep your finger on Genesis. We won't come back. John 1 verse 1 says this. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. In the beginning, God existed. In the beginning, Jesus was with him. In the beginning, God. 
That is something we have got to understand. Jesus existed before everything, anything ever was even put on his axis. Go to Colossians chapter 1, same thing. These are important scriptures you need to highlight. Colossians 1 verse 15 says this, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. So when Jesus was here, when we saw him, we saw the Father. Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. When you see me, you see the Father who sits in heaven. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Some versions say firstborn. That simply means supreme. He's the first one here, the first one to do anything. For through him, God created a couple things. You ain't paying attention. God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. It's amazing we see this. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. He existed before anything else. Say that with me. And he holds all creation together. So when you see that sun, when you see the moon, when you see the stars, and you wonder, man, who hung that? It is God. It is God holding it together. And the same God who's holding that, the entire galaxy together is the same God who can hold your life together. So the Holy Spirit inspired all three of these writers to say the same thing 1,600 years apart, that the almighty God in relationship with his son and his spirit put the world on his axis. And when God spoke, everything came into being. Go back to Genesis 1. Let me show you this. Look at this, man. This just gets crazy. I love this. Genesis 1, verse 2. This blows your mind. When you read what happens in Genesis, it says this. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed and morning came, marking the first day. God spoke through his word and the Bible says through his son, everything was created. And what's amazing is that God created things progressively. He didn't just bam and everything was here. He started here and he started there. And the Bible says as he did things, he then created the atmosphere, and he saw saw that it was good. And then the Bible says he he then created land. He said, let there be land that divides the waters, and he saw that it was good. And then the Bible says he then said, let there be more stars and more galaxies and more planets, and all those things are for you to mark seasons, times, and years. He said, that's why those stars and everything is up there, for you to mark all these things. And then the Bible says, he said, let there be plants and grow up that grow up with vegetation, and all these things were growing. And then he says, let there be animals that, 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 that team in the sea and, and on land with birds and, and cattle. And he said, all these things are good, every, every last thing of it. God said, with, with the word of his mouth, everything he said was good. So again, here in Genesis 1 and 2, we're seeing what's happening. He's giving us detail, he's not, but he's not going into great detail. He's not showing us the atoms and the the plants, and he's not seeing all the the small molecules. He's not showing us the human chromosome. The Bible's not concerned about that. It's concerned about showing you who and why, and we see why. We see the six days of creation. People even debate that. Was it six literal 24-hour days, or was it millions of years? Regardless, these six periods of time Show us how the amazing God said, let there be. And every time Elohim spoke, every time Jehovah spoke, another creation was made. The who was God, the Trinity God, the the one who is three in one. So remember, the original audience, they're fresh out of Egypt. They're reading this for the first time. They're seeing all these different things. And they had Egypt down inside of them. All they knew was the Egyptian gods. They knew the Egyptian gods of the sun. They knew the Egyptian reptile gods. But when they read about this god, it was mind-blowing for them. They saw all this happen. Moses says, the one god who brought you out of Egypt is the one who hung the stars. 
the, the one God who did all those miracles, who, who brought you out on eagle's wings, he's the one who you are made in his image like. He's the one who made all these things. The one God in heaven. After they saw all this, it was so much easier for them to understand that this is the God who Moses says he is. But the greatest thing in creation that God made was not the sun. It wasn't the moon. The greatest thing that God created in creation, it wasn't the trees, it wasn't the animals. We're going to see what God created that was so amazing. Look at verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God made human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea. Reign over the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. The final and highest part of God's creation was you. The greatest piece of creation that God made was you and me. And why is that? Because you were made in his image. Not necessarily like you don't have God's nose or his mouth or his teeth. You probably have a big nose if you look like God, right? But he, he didn't make you. That's not necessarily that. He made you in his image and his likeness. What that means is you are, you're supposed to have his values and his morals. No other thing on planet earth can think like you can think. None can. He made you in his image. And, and it's so amazing to understand that the, the man and the woman were his special possession. What, what happened is when God created everything else, he, he, he made it, he spoke it. But when he created you, he rest inside of himself. If you can understand that, it would blow your mind. When God created you, he gave you a spirit. You were made in his image. Mankind was made in the image of God. You did not evolve from no monkey. My mom used to tell me that all the time. She's like, Scotty, when you go to school, take their test, that's fine. But no, you didn't come from no monkey. Okay? You, you did not crawl out, out of a cesspool like an amoeba. You did not do that. You were made in the image of the almighty God. And that's what you got to understand. Nothing else in creation was made with God's image except you. You have his stamp. You have his seal of approval. And when the people of Israel were reading this and they heard this for the first time, it blew their minds. He said, you, you mean the God who split the Red Sea? I'm made in his image? Yes. The, the very God who did all these miracles for them, he's, we're made in his image. They, probably, they had probably heard of, of the Egyptian myths of creation and all these things. But, but the God of heaven made us in his image with his character and his principles and his value. Nothing else is made like, like you except what God, how God made it. He put his spirit down inside of you. That, that is why, that is why I don't care if you, if you get married, I don't care if you ever get the job you get, if you get the house that you ever want to get. If you are not connected to God, if you are not constantly seeking the spirit of God, you will never be fulfilled. Because your spirit needs to be connected to him. That's right. Listen, your spirit, your spirit longs to be connected to where it came from. Deep calling unto deep, your soul connected to him. That is why each and every day you've got to be searching and seeking God. The more you do it, the more you'll be fulfilled. Nothing on this earth was meant to fulfill you. You didn't come from this earth. You came from the creator. And when your spirit connects to his, when you are continually seeking after what God wants, it fills you. There's fulfillment. There's purpose because you were made in his image. Man, if you, if you could understand that, man, it would blow your mind. Right, the same God, he told Adam and Eve, guys, I want you to dominate. Dominate the earth, rule the earth. Everything I created is under your subjection. And he says, be fruitful and multiply. Guys, you got to understand this. Your identity comes from being a child of God. We just sung about it. Your identity comes with being a child who is made in the image of God. That is where your identity comes from. Perfectly made like God made you. The Bible says he knit you together in your mother's womb. Every stitch was perfect. The entire human chromosome. He said, I did that. I made you the way you are. I, I put that. 
He said, I put that down. I put the hair on your head, the big nose that you have, the googly eyes that you have. He said, I put those in you. I, I did it, God said. I'm the one who knits you together. And every time we do that, he, he says, I put my breath down inside of you. That, 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 that is what it is. He says, it's for me. And so when the birds chirp and they do what they were called to do and made to do, that's giving God glory. Every time you see the, the, the trees blow in the wind, it is giving glory to the God who made them. And when you do what you are called to do, seeking God and, and seeking him first and living how he called you to live, you will have fulfillment and purpose and your life will bring him glory. That is what it's about because you were made in his image. So important we see that. Guys, your goal in life is not to get applause from people. That's why social media is so dangerous for you. Your goal in life is to get applause from God. I'm telling you, man, when you learn to constantly seek the creator, and listen to me, I don't care how saved you are. I don't care if you've been in ministry. I don't care where you're at. You have got to every day seek the creator. Every day. Because life will tear down your faith. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? You got to constantly seek my, my creator where I came from. And he'll fill you. That is where God gave us our identity, the core of my identity. Let me, let me say something else to you about this. The core of your identity isn't even what gender you are. Hear me what I'm saying to you. The core of your identity is not what nationality you are. The core of your identity is not about who your ancestors are, where you came from. The very foundation of your, of your identity is that you are a child of God made in his image, who've been saved by, by the grace of God. That is where it starts. That is where it is. Your, your identity starts with being who you are in Christ. So whatever skin color he put me in, whatever height I have, whatever weight I have, whatever gender he put me in is correct. Because that is how he made me. Whatever, whatever body he put me in, our creator makes no mistakes. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? The world tries to put it down in our mind that we're a mistake, that we're not supposed to be here. I don't care what anybody says. You were fearfully and marvelously made in the image of your creator. But not only that, before we get up out of here, let me show you this. I think it's so important we see this. When God created things, he had a very important word. He gave things order. This is a very important concept you've got to understand. God gave order. He didn't just create things and say, all right, go ahead. When he, gave, when he created Adam and Eve, he gave them structure. He gave them a system. He gave them order. He said, I created you male and female. Now go multiply in the earth. And some of you all did a good job of that. <laughs> some of you all heard God loud and clear. All right. All right. Got a bunch of little ones running around back there in the kids' area. That's okay. We'll take care of them. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth. That's my order. The Bible says God put down seed inside of everything so that it can reproduce after itself. So every plant reproduces after its own kind. You'll never see an apple tree make corn. Why? Because it doesn't have a corn seed. You'll never see a monkey create a horse. Why? Because a monkey has the monkey seed. Everything will create after its own kind. That is God's order. That's his order. That's the order he set. Even the planets, guys, can you imagine this? The planets that God put orbit the sun, and every 365 days, you go around the sun. It's amazing. That's order. Like all the planets, these, none of these things collide because God has put that much order. Do you realize we can calculate the sun rise down to the millisecond? Why? Because there's that much order. We can literally put a rocket on the moon because there's so much systematic or because we can, we can scale it down to the, to the minute detail. Because there's that much order in the solar system, in, in, in the universe. We serve a God who creates order. And not only that, he has also gave us order for ourselves. God made an order for the family. That's his structure. God made an order for marriage. That's his structure. God made an order for your own body. If you don't follow God's order for your body, you're going to get sick. He created order for our conduct. Everything we have has order. And when mankind disrupts God's order, things break down. When, when mankind goes against the order of God, things start to break down. Sometimes we have problems in our life and we wonder, man, why I got this issue? Why I got Because you have stepped out of God's order. We're going to talk about that next week. 
What, why we want to kick against God's order. If, if we can just look at our life, God, why is this happening? Why is that happening? Are you lining up to the order that God has put? When any man, any woman, any child, or anybody else who submits their life to the order of God will find life. I promise you that. When we submit ourselves to the order and structure of the creator, you'll find life and you'll find fulfillment. I promise you, you will. If you submit your entire life, the Bible says, lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll guide your path. But you got to acknowledge him with his order that he created, the structure that he created. God said, if you, if you follow my plan, I'll guide every step of your life. But we got to be willing to lay that down. And that is what the people of Israel heard. When they saw this, when they came out of Egypt and, and Moses wrote down the book of Genesis, he was showing them God's plan. He was showing them God's structure. And it was blow, mind-blowing to them. Moses, Moses wrote to show the people of Israel who the true God of heaven was and why he created them and what he wanted from them. The book of Genesis doesn't go into every little detail. It's not supposed to. But it shows us where we get our help from and where we came from and what our life should line up to. Amen? That is what we, are, that is what we see. And we're going to continue to see this throughout this series. So I got some homework for you. That's right. School started. I want you to go home this week. And I want you to read Genesis chapter 1. Read Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Read God's order. Read his structure. Highlight it. We're going to come back and we're going to talk even more about what God's word said. Also, I want you to jump into John chapter 1. Read John chapter 1 through uh, 1 and through 18. Read how God created everything and how he put everything into existence. It's mind-blowing. I love it. Let's dive into the word of God, God, so, so God's word can dive into us. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are. God, I thank you because you are a God of structure. You are a God of order. You are a God who created every system and process that we have. God, even more than that, God, you even guide our own small lives that we have right now. And God, so many, so many of us need our lives guided. So many of us, God, need to come right back to the basics. And see what you've done for us. And God, I ask that as we read your word, as we dive into it, we see your plan. We see how you are the God of heaven. And God, so many of us need to just see that and just rest in that and live in it. Lord, we love you and we thank you for what you're doing through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.